So this unit is on imaginary and complex numbers. So before we get started on the unit, I want to do just a quick explanation and review of math symbols. And basically a symbol is not a variable. Oftentimes in math we have big numbers or different numbers or irrational numbers that we like to represent as symbols instead of the actual number because it takes a lot of time to actually write out that whole number. So one example that uh, we're all familiar with is pi. So pi is just a symbol that represents 3.14159 and so forth. And we've, and we've used that in geometry and trigonometry and so forth. You'll be seeing a, another symbol called E, which, which is actually Euler's number, which is the natural base, which is 2.71828. Again, that's not a variable, that's just a letter that we use to uh, signify that number. And you, and you can actually see that in most calculators. Uh, those of you who are artists and are interested in art and architecture, there's something called the golden ratio. And that's actually represented by the lowercase letter phi. Again, that's not a variable. That's just what uh, mathematicians and people use to represent that number. Well, we're going to also introduce something called I. And it's usually shown as a as an italic I. In print, you'll see it something like this. And so that's a lowercase I, and it's actually an italic I. And that is going to equal the square root of negative 1. Again, it is not a variable. It is actually I is the square root of negative 1. So if we see that in math, in the things that we're doing, that's actually what it is. Now we actually like to draw it like this, or in italics like that, or in cursive, because if we do it like this, it's very easy for it to be confused with a 1. So we tend to do it either in cursive, or you'll see it in italics in print in a textbook. But for the sake of this class, I'm going to go ahead and write it in cursive. That way it won't be confused with the number 1. Again, that's i, and i is the square root of negative 1. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into our lesson. So before we start it, I'm going to go ahead and just review some basic Algebra 1 concepts that we'll be using when we do imaginary and complex numbers. So if I asked you to simplify these expressions, this expression we're adding together two binomials. So all we do is we combine like terms and we have 2 plus 7x. In this case, I first have to distribute my negative sign. So it's 1 minus 3x minus 4 minus 3x. I distributed that negative all the way through. And now we combine like terms, and I'll get negative 3 minus 6x. And then, last but not least, if I'm going to multiply two binomials, I use the FOIL method which is going to be first, which is 3 times 5 is 15, outside, which is 3 times negative 4x, which is minus 12x, inside is plus 5x, and last is going to be minus 4x squared. And now I combine like terms where I can, and I have uh, 15 minus 12x plus 5x is minus 7x, and then minus 4x squared. So that's how we would do it normally in an Algebra 1 class. We can also do and solve equations. So if I was going to solve x squared equals 9, it would simply be x equals plus or minus 3. Again, I just took the square root of both sides and solved it. 
In this case, I'm going to go ahead and add 4 to both sides. I get 3x squared equals 27. x squared equals 9, after dividing both sides by 3. And I get x equals plus or minus 3 again. And then on this problem here, on problem C, I'm going to subtract 2 from both sides. I get one-third x squared equals 3. And then I simply multiply both sides by 3. And that's going to give me x squared equals 9. Again, we take the square root of both sides. And I get x equals plus or minus 3. Okay, and now we come to this problem here. So notice I have x squared equals negative 9. Well, I've seen some students say, oh, well, that's just going to be x equals plus or minus 3. But is that really right? Well, if I do negative 3 squared, that equals 9, which does not equal ne negative 9. And if I do 3 squared, that equals 9 as well, which does not equal negative 9. So we say that there is no solution. So that's how we do things in Algebra 1 and some of our basic concepts of solving equations and also simplifying basic equations. So let's go ahead and introduce just briefly the imaginary number i. So we have the imaginary number and that equals i. And i equals the square root of negative 1. i squared equals negative 1. So that's how that works. Let's go ahead and look at it on a graph. So where before I had x and y axes, now I have real and imaginary axes. So for example, here I might have 1, here I'm going to have i, here I'm going to have negative 1, and then down here I'm going to have i, negative i. Now notice, if I raise 1 actually equals i to the 0, because don't forget anything raised to the 0 power is 1. Also, i to the 4th, because if I do the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1, which is going to be i times i times i times i, that equals these two equal negative 1 times negative 1, which equals 1. So i to the fourth equals 1. I go up here, and I have i, and that can just be i to the 1. I go over to my negative 1, and that just equals i squared. And when I go down to the bottom part of my imaginary axis, negative i just equals i cubed. So it's kind of an interesting thing you can kind of observe here. Notice if I go around my plane or my axes counterclockwise, I, I have i to the 0, i to the 1, i to the 2, i to the 3, and i to the 4. So let's go ahead and try and simplify some of these i's. So again, we said that i equals the square root of negative 1. i squared equals the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1, which equals negative 1. So, so if I have i to the third, that just equals i squared times i, which equals negative 1 times i, which just equals negative i. In the same way, if I have i to the fourth, I have i squared times i squared, 
which is negative 1 times negative 1, which just equals 1. Now notice i to the fifth. There's a couple of ways I can do this. I can say, because we now know that i to the fourth is 1, I can say that this equals i to the fourth times i, which just equals i. Or if you'd prefer to do it something like this, you could also say i squared times i squared times i, which equals negative 1 times negative 1 times i, which just equals i. So either of those will give you the correct answer. I prefer the top one, and we'll get into that later. So i to the 16th simply equals i to the 4th raised to the 4th power, and i to the 4th we know is just 1 to the 4th, which equals 1. So you can see it's a pretty straightforward, pretty easy way to do that. So let's go ahead and do a little more with complex numbers. So basically imaginary numbers are used to express the roots of negative numbers. So again we had i equals the square root of negative 1 i squared equals negative 1. Now complex numbers is the sum of a real number and an imaginary number. And complex numbers are in the form of a plus b i where a is the equals the real part and b i equals the imaginary part. So as soon as you see the i after some number that's going to be the imaginary part of the number. So let's go ahead and talk about how we do operations on complex numbers. So to add and subtract we just do what we did up front at the beginning of the lesson and we simply combine like terms. Okay, so to multiply, there's two ways we can do this. We use the distributive property if we have a monomial. So, for example, if I have 2i times 6 minus 5i, that's just going to be 12i minus 10i squared. And then, of course, we can simplify that as well and make that 12i plus 10 or 10 plus 12i. For two complex numbers, we use FOIL. So, for example, if I have 7 minus 2i times 6 minus 5i, I would simply FOIL it. And we'll do some more of these a little later. Now, to divide, we multiply the numerator and the denominator by the conjugate of the imaginary number, or of the complex number. Well, what's a conjugate? Well, a conjugate is just another word for the term, for the opposite term of the difference of squares. So all we do is if I have a complex number is I change the sign of the imaginary part of a complex number. So for example, if I have 7 minus 3i, its conjugate is going to be 
7 plus 3i. If I have 2 plus 5i, its conjugate is going to be 2 minus 5i. So it's that simple. So to actually divide, what I'm going to do is multiply the numerator and the denominator by the conjugate. And it's really that easy. So let's go ahead and work some examples. So if I'm going to go ahead and add and subtract these, again, the important thing is that we write the answers in standard form. And as you recall, standard form is going to be a plus bi. So again, we combine like terms. So 5 plus 7 is 12. Negative 11i plus 4i is minus 7i. That's all there is to it. In this case, we're going to go ahead and distribute that minus sign. So it's going to be plus 11 plus 6i. Combine like terms and we get 6 plus 7i. And then my last one will do the same thing. 2 plus 6i. 6i. Distribute the minus, minus 12 plus i. And we're left with negative 10 plus 7i. So now let's go ahead and try some products in multiplication. So first thing we're going to do with this one is we have a monomial times an, a complex number or an imaginary number times a complex number. And so we just multiply it. 4i times 3 is 12i. And then we have 4i times minus 5i is minus 20i squared. And now notice this is going to be 12i minus 20 times negative 1, which is 12i plus 20. And then we have to flip it around. Again, a plus bi so that it's in standard form. So it's going to be 20 plus 12i. And let's go ahead and do another one like that. 7i times 2 is going to be 14i. 7 times negative 9i is minus 63i squared, which winds up being 14i minus 63 times negative 1, which winds up being 63 plus 14i. And then our next problem is consists of two complex numbers, so we have to FOIL. So we're going to first do 5 times 6, which is 30, outside will be 5 times negative 7i minus 35i. Inside is 6 times 4i plus 24i. And of course, last is 7i times 4i is going to be minus 28i squared. And now we go and simplify. So let's go ahead and start simplifying. We have 30 and then minus 35i plus 24i is minus 11i and minus 28i squared winds up being minus 28 times negative 1 and that's going to be 30 minus 11i plus 28 which winds up simplifying to 58 minus 11i and that's our answer. And we do the same thing here. 7 times negative 2 is negative 14. Outside is again negative 35i. Inside is plus 6i. And last is plus 15i squared. And then we simplify, negative 14, and this equals negative 
i, 15i squared translates to minus 15, since the i squared is negative 1. And now we're left with negative 29 minus 29i. Okay, now we can go ahead and start dividing. So again, what we do with these is we multiply the number times the conjugate of the denominator. We multiply the numerator and the denominator by the conjugate. So the conjugate of 3 minus i is going to be 3 plus i. So we're going to do 3 plus i and 3 plus i. And then we simply multiply. So we have 2 times 3 is 6 plus 2i is on the top. On the bottom, we have 3 times 3, which is 9, and then minus i squared. Now, notice that we don't FOIL it, because if you notice what a conjugate is, this is the difference between two squares, which is an Algebra 1 concept, which means all we do is have to multiply this first term and the last term, because if we do the FOIL operation, the inside and outside cancel out. So this is going to equal 6 plus 2i. And notice that the i squared is going to be negative 1. So the bottom winds up being 9 plus 1, which equals 6 plus 2i over 10. And what we do with this is we simplify it. So notice. I'm going to go ahead and break this down. So this is going to be 6 over 10 plus 2 over 10i. And these reduce further as 3 fifths plus 1 fifth i. Notice we did this so that this is in standard form, which again is a plus bi. OK, so similarly, we can do this problem here. again. I'm going to multiply it times the conjugate over the conjugate. So it's going to be, in this case, 4 plus i, 4 plus i. And then we simply FOIL the top, which is going to be 20 plus outside is 5i, inside is 16 i, and last is 4i squared, all over 4, actually it's going to be all over 4 squared, minus i squared, and this equals 20 plus 21, and again i squared is negative 1, so it's going to be minus 4 in this case, and all over 4 squared is 16 minus negative 1. So this winds up being 16 plus 21i all over 17. And again, notice that our bottom is always going to be a real number. So whenever you multiply a complex number by its conjugate, it's going to always be a real number. If you don't, that means you probably did something wrong. So let's get and solve this problem here. So notice we're going to multiply this by the conjugate of the bottom in both the numerator and the denominator. So it's going to be 2 plus 5i, 2 plus 5i. And then we simply FOIL it. So it's going to be 14 and then plus 35i plus 8i plus 20i squared all over 4 minus 25i squared. And that's going to equal 
14 plus 43i minus 20 all over 4 minus 25 times negative 1, which is going to be plus. And now we just simplify it. So this is going to be negative 6 plus 43i over 29. And to put it into standard form, we would do negative 6 over 29 plus 43 over 29 i. And that's it. Now, one thing I do want you to see is this, is if I have 3 plus 4i multiplied by its conjugate 3 minus 4i, it is going to always wind up as this squared, which is 3 squared, plus this number squared, 4 squared. So that would be 25. So no matter what, as you can see from the pattern of the problems that we were just doing, that pattern always happens. So if I have, you know, a 7 minus 2i times 7 plus 2i, all you really have to do is just say, okay, that's going to be 7 times 7 is 49, 2 times 2 is 4, plus 4, and that's going to be 53. So even though I did this problem where I made the i squared negative 1 and so forth, for conjugates, this always works like this, this pattern. So that might save you some work and some time as you're working these problems. Okay, so let's go ahead and start simplifying some expressions as well with i. So one thing that we did, and, and I want to kind of point out, is this. If I were to do a table, and if I said, okay, I have i, which of course equals the square root of negative 1, and then I have i squared equals negative 1, i cubed equals i squared times i, which equals negative i, i to the fourth equals i squared times i squared, which equals negative 1 times negative 1, which equals 1. And then I go i to the fifth, which equals i to the fourth times i, which is just 1 times i, which equals i i to the sixth equals i to the fourth times i squared, which just equals 1 times negative 1 or negative 1. i to the seventh equals i to the fourth times i to the third, which just equals negative i. And then i to the eighth equals i to the fourth times i to the fourth equals 1 times 1, which equals 1. So notice when I did these, you, you can kind of see a pattern. And basically what I did was I used the i above to actually define it. And as we reduce these, that's the technique that you'll use. Now one thing to observe is notice that if my exponent, if my exponent is divisible by 4, then my i to the 4th, my i to the 8th is equal to 1. And that works if for anything. So for example, if I had i to the 20th, okay, that's going to equal i to the 4th, you know, raised to the 5th, which equals 1 to the 5th, which equals 1. Or another way you could do it is that equals i to the 4th times i to the 4th times i to the 4th times i to the 4th, which is just 1 times 1 times 1 times 1, which equals 1. So that, that's a pattern that you, you can really look at and use. Now, what I also want to show you, and you may know this or may not know this, but 
let me go ahead and review it. So let me show you a little trick here with numbers that are divisible by 4. So if the last two numbers of any number is divisible by 4, then the entire number is uh, divisible by 4. So notice these two numbers are divisible by 4, so that means that this number 384 is uh, divisible by 4. So in fact, I'll show it to you. So 4 goes into 38 uh, 9 times, and then 4 goes into 24 left over 6, so that equals 96. Again, I can do this with, with really anything. If I have, uh, you know, 2, 5, 2, 4, I can do the same thing. So if I do, okay, 4 goes into 25 uh, 6 times, and then 4 goes into 24 6 times, so that, that's going to be 606. And if I multiply 606 times 4, that's going to be 25, 24. So that's a pattern that you can use um, on these problems. So let's go ahead and see how to apply that. So what we're going to do is, is say, okay, i to the fifth is equal to i to the fourth times i. And we can see here that 56 is uh, divisible by 4. So that would mean that i to the 156 equals 1. So now we're left with just 1 times i times 1, and that's simply going to equal i, and that's my answer. Again, notice on this, I have i to the 6th, which breaks to i to the 4th times i to the 2nd. 525 I can break into i to the well, 524, because that's divisible by 4, times i to the 1. And so these two are the number 1, which leaves me with i to the third, which we know equals negative i. And these problems are really that easy. Um, i to the 72, well, that's i divisible by 4. So this is going to be 1. And 40 is i divisible by 4. So that's going to also be 1. So this equals 1. And that's pretty much how the imaginary and complex numbers work. One thing that is also helpful, and it'll probably happen anyway over time as you're working these problems, is if you kind of memorize this little table here, because I can tell you that most of these I reduction problems tend to be like this, where they're going to all reduce to something in this table. So that's always kind of helpful. In fact, you can actually just redo it where you have uh, something like uh, you have i equals the square root of negative 1, i squared equals negative 1, i cubed equals negative i, i to the fourth equals 1, i to the fifth equals i, i to the 6th equals negative 1, i to the 7th equals negative i, and i to the 8th equals 1. So this is a pretty helpful little table, and eventually, again, you'll just do this automatically, and it won't be a big deal. So that's about all I have on this lesson. If you have any questions on anything, please let me know.